what I would call the nuts and bolts kind of type of training that I try to gear these towards. Um, we have had all had a lot of experiences, I suspect, with somebody walking in the door and saying, my, my husband passed, and I'm not on the mortgage or the note, um, but the mortgage company won't speak with me. Now what do I do? So this is meant to help with that very practical type of situation that we face. Um, and uh, two fantastic trainers have agreed to present today. Terry Brown Steiner with the Odorisi Law Firm. He's a private attorney here in uh, Rochester. Um, and Dion Woodburn, who is with JASA um, in uh, Legal Services for the Elderly in Queens. So thank you, you both, and I turn it over to you. Uh, first, I'll start. This is Terry Brown Steiner. Uh, just as a brief introduction, I work legal services three years and have been in private practice for 26 years. Uh, I know you all have the materials. In the beginning, we're going to do some straight out reading, but trust me, we're not going to read this whole thing to you. Just save time for questions. Also, please feel free to uh, call me anytime for advice. Hi, I'm Dion Woodburn. I guess that would be the female voice here. And um, we're going, I've been working with uh, legal services now since 2003. It, it, it scares me a little bit. And unfortunately, I see a lot of these problems um, with, because I only work with the elderly, with someone passing away. Okay, Terry? Okay, next page, please. Okay. I tried to uh, come up with some common scenarios that uh, I I think most of you looking at your legal services background have dealt with this before. Uh, the first is a common situation where someone has been, their partner has died or their parent has died. They've been making payments for years. The bank doesn't know that the uh, property owner has died. Not until they, they fall behind in payments and they get a call from a counselor do they realize that the bank realizes someone passed away. Then all of a sudden they change the coding and they won't release information. Sometimes they won't accept payments. I've seen that a couple of times. The second situation is where someone uh, believes they're automatically the executor because they're named as an executor under a will. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Also, we see situations where people believe simply because they are the next of kin, they have a right to get information from the bank. I've also seen situations if where someone is trying to get either a home energy assistance loan or a loan for a furnace and they need to be put on the deed. And they come to you asking for a deed, but it's not at all that simple. The next two situations I see is where they're already in foreclosure. And they're, they're told they need an estate proceeding, they can't come up with the money, or they, they just don't know what to do when the foreclosure uh, proceeding is moving along so fast. One of the things that I think a lot of you know, but, but some people don't, and the clients often don't know, is that uh, once the bank finds out that someone has passed away, subject to things that Dion is going to talk about, uh, the bank is obligated to often wait for a court-appointed representative subject to some other limitations. And you need to help make the client understand that this requires a court process. So although the banks are often wrong in how they deal with uh, our borrowers, particularly in default, the fact that they're raising a guard and needing someone appointed is often correct. So um, when we look at the death of someone um, uh, in an action, a party in the action, that action is automatically stayed. And, and what happens on the CPLR Section 1015 is the court orders that there is a substitution. Um, and so because if, once the person dies, the court really doesn't have jurisdiction, and the court will automatically stay the proceeding. And um, we have sites here. I'm not going to go through the sites. And then, someone has to someone has to let the bank attorney know, though, correct? Yes, someone definitely has to let the bank attorney know that that the party died, um, and um, you have to, of course, let the court know. And then um, once you let the court know, then um, then you actually do a motion for the stay. Um, when you have a, a client and spouse, when both of them on, are on the deed and um, they're taking it as tenants in, in common, and both parties are on the uh, mortgage and note, right? If you only represent the decedent, then that matter is stayed. So, for example, you know, um, 
since we have a client, I'll make the lady, she'll be 80, and you have her spouse who's 55, and um, the, the client passes away. Now, as the attorney, and you're only the attorney for the, for the um, client, the lady who passed away at 80, um, you're automatically discharged, and the second department holds that the death of a party terminates the attorney-client um, relationship. So you as the law firm or legal services provider, you do not automatically represent the estate. In fact, it, especially in the scenario I gave you with the spouse being 55, we couldn't even represent the spouse if we wanted to because they don't meet the, the requisite age requirement. So then, um, let's say you, once again, you have a client and spouse, and they're both on, on the deed, and both are parties on the mortgage and note. If you represent both of the parties, then the property will pass by operation of law, and you don't have to go to probate. You can just automatically continue um, the discussion. Now, if the client is married, uh, but the decedent is the only person on the deed, but both parties are on the mortgage and note, and let's just, just take kids out of the picture. Let's just make it as simple as possible. Then once again, the client, the home passes to the client by the operation of law, and you can once again just continue your negotiation. One of the things that clients don't often understand is that the power of attorney terminates on death. I think most of us are familiar with that, uh, and they get confused because they've been dealing with the bank as a power of attorney for a long time. I'm once the bank finds out about the death, they properly won't recognize the power of attorney. Uh, generally, it's been my experience when they find out that there's a death, they consider it an acceleration uh, provision. Uh, due on death is often a clause in most mortgages subject to a lot of the rights that Dion's going to talk about. I wanted to go over a few things uh, about uh, probate administration. I'll go over some later. But the main concept is that if your client is named as an executor, there's absolutely nothing automatic about that. They're simply called the proposed executor. A court proceeding is required to formalize the appointment, which is the probate process. As I said in the materials, attorneys are often criticized as if they make probate complicated, but probate is actually fairly complicated. The result of probate it's to have the will approved as the valid last will and testament and to have an executor appointed. Uh, the court will issue a decree of probate and will issue letters testamentary. And if you want a copy of those letters, they're called certificates of appointment. This is what the clients often call in with, saying the bank wants letters, the bank wants certificates, and they think that you can simply call the court and get those often, not always, but they, often people think it's simple, and it's not simple. You have to file a petition or probate to get the letters, and we'll talk about the process a little bit more. And I have learned something in dealing with uh, uh, looking at the materials today, because in my experience, most times the bank will not do a modification where the mortgage or has died. There are a lot of limitations to that. That's been my experience because they gave the loan to the party that they did the credit assessment on who now has passed away. And often it's a new underwriting issue. At least that's been my experience. Could we pause for questions if there's any questions at this point? So far there are none. Okay, okay. let's go. Great. So, and um, as Terry said, that's, that's generally the, ca the case where the bank will tell you often that um, the due, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about it um, in a little bit, the due on sale clause um, comes into effect. But let, let's just take it step by step. So I'm going to give you an example. You have Miss G, their husband and wife. Both of them are on the deed, um, and they own it by tennis by the entirety. And I know I keep on throwing that out, and I guess there's no question, so I guess everyone knows that, that they would automatically just get it once the person dies. Um, now, both the husband and wife are on the mortgage, but the husband is on the note, and the wife is not on the note, and the husband passes away. So when that happened, and this is a real case, the bank refused to talk to Mrs. G. And, but Mrs. G has some rights. 
she now the deed she it, she owns the property solely by operation of law and she actually has the right to assume um, the note still if, if I could ask a question yeah. if, if she has the right to assume the note is there a, a uh, an underwriting process for that that she has to show herself to be credit worthy no well actually and we're going to get to that Okay. See, I, I think um, Terry just wants us to, to, to go ahead, but, but Terry's absolutely right. With, with this, you're going to see as we get um, through that um, she will be able to assume without the normal um, procedure of proving that she can actually assume. So um, when she's assuming, right, that simply means that she has the right to repay, will she have the right to um, repay the debt? Once again, we, we inform the bank the bank refused to talk to Mrs. G. So we had to file a complaint with the AG's office. Now once we file the complaint with the AG's office, and you know of course you can file a complaint with other regulatory agencies as well, but we, in this case we filed a complaint with the, with the AG's office. And when we did that, and, and that is, is something too, sometimes you, you, even when you file the complaint, you actually have to back it up with the law that supports you as well. Um, because the AG's office doesn't only deal with cases like this, so we, we backed it up with the law. And one of the cases that we cited was City Mortgage versus Lumpkin. And there, um, the transfer of, of interest, you can read it, to a spouse is protected. And the mortgage servicer may not exercise a due on sale clause. And with a due on sale clause, that provision in the contract simply says that the full balance of the loan may be called due, like it has to be repaid in full, um, if the real property is sold or transferred without the lender's prior written consent, right? And if I could interrupt, that's mm -hmm. a, that makes a lot of sense because folks have to understand that when they're selling the property, they can't simply continue to make payments to the bank. The bank, the bank logically expects to be paid off when you're selling the property in most cases. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that would, of course, happen if we weren't talking about family, right, a family, a spouse or children. Um, so this due and sale clause is actually preempted by federal law um, when the transfer is to a, fa a family member. So, and sometimes what the bank was doing, especially with Ms. G, was they were saying, Look, we're we're doing we're exercising our due and sale clause, um, and even despite the fact that she was the spouse, and um, even with, with them not allowing Miss G to make payment, um, that is them exercising their, their due and sale clause because of course now they're saying that the property should be in foreclosure. Henry Smith also holds that. A mortgage servicers must participate in mandatory loss mitigation when a non-borrower who acquired the property in a Garn St. Germain protected transfer. And that's what I'm talking about, the federal law. Um, the protected transfer is the protect um, between a spouse or, or children. And in this instance, in, that's what we're talking about. Um, and in, in the um, absence of an explicit prohibition in the mortgage, um, a mortgage can be freely assumed, and a lender has no ability to disallow that assumption. Um, and that's just basic contract law, right? A contract can be freely assigned. Um, now, the Fannie Mae uh, servicing guidelines on the Section 408 requires that when the servicer learns of a transfer ownership, it should notify the new owner, inform them the mortgage loan is due, and the due and sale clause in, is invoked. And, and that's what the banks are, are, are saying, that we're following the line. How, we're fo following the guidelines. However, Ms. G is protected by uh, Garn St. Germain. And, and w this is exactly the point that Terry was, was bringing up. Section 408 calls for a non-qualified assumption, so there are no underwriting or impediments for widows, heirs, or divorcees. I would suggest that you consider at that point, though, if your client has judgments against him or her, understand that as soon as they take title to the property, uh, that judgment lien is going to attach. So you may yourself be interested in the creditworthiness of your client if you're going to pursue that. Mm -hmm. 
And um, so then you look at um, CSTB um, requires the services to maintain policies and procedures that are reasonably designed to achieve enumerated objectives. And one of the objectives it includes upon notification of the death of the borrower, they have to promptly identify and facilitate communication with the successor. So once you notify the borrower that the, um, in, in my situation, that the client had passed away who was the wife, that was the first case we had given, once we notify that they have passed away, then um, you let them know the successor in, in, in interest, uh, which is now the spouse of the deceased borrower um, uh, with respect to the property secured by the deceased, bar deceased borrower's mortgage loan, right? So then, um, now when we talk about assumptions, though, we know that assumptions, again, may bring their own problems. Because here it is with Miss G, she's, like I said, she's entitled to assume the mortgage. But as Terry said, you want to talk to them about assuming that mortgage. Because now they're taking on a debt that they didn't originally owe. They're not taking on a debt and saying, look, I'm going to now be personally liable for that debt. And they have to have the ability to repay that debt. So you do want to really counsel your clients to see whether this is a good option. If the house is clearly underwater, if there's nothing that, that they could do, if there's no reverse mortgage, if there's no financing that could help them, and they're going to just eventually lose the house, maybe assuming the mortgage is not the best thing. But of course, you know, we have the problems with um, not assuming the mortgage. That usually means they're going to be losing their home, right? And I, I don't do bankruptcy at all, but in bankruptcy um, court, um, at, in some instances, you don't even have to assume the, the mortgage because, the, um, remember, uh, the bank actually has a claim on the property. So sometimes you can even pay back the mortgage without actually doing the formal assumption. And at the same, if I could just say, add to that before we take the questions. In bankruptcy court, if you... If you owe a lot more than the property is worth and you have some sort of a repayment plan with your creditors, you're allowed to do something called the cram down, which means you only pay and treat as secured the value of the debt up to the value of the home, and the amount over that is considered unsecured and may be discharged. So it might be an appropriate time if your client is a bankruptcy candidate to consider going to a bankruptcy attorney to get advice about this. Any questions? We have a number of questions, if we can pause. Yeah. Um, see if we can start from getting here. So what happens if the property was already in a loan modification process and the mortgagor dies? Would the mod still continue or would it be stayed? It, it depends on who it is that's taking over the property. Um, you, you, the, the initially, once the person passes away, you would actually stay the proceeding until everything goes into place, you, until if, if, it's, um, if it's a spouse and it's by operation of, of law, you, ne you don't necessarily have to stay the proceeding. You can actually continue with the modification process. Um, if it's not a spouse, if it's another heir, you may want to stay the proceeding until all the ducks are in a row and then you continue on with the modification process. But obviously you have the loss of income of the party that deceased, so I assume there's some modifications to the modification application. Exactly. Okay. Okay, so the next question is what happens if the property was all, oops, I totally read that one already, I apologize. Um, okay, um, the case is, this is some bankruptcy questions, I don't know if either one of you can answer it, but we'll try. The cases cited are in bankruptcy court where the home is an asset of the bankruptcy estate, which makes it a slightly different situation than outside of bankruptcy. Are there any cases outside the bankruptcy context in which a bank, which a bank was directed to consider modification for a surviving spouse family member in default? Yes, there, there are cases. If you don't mind, um, my contact information is there. If you would just direct, um, send me an email, I'll shoot you the cases. That's it. That's all I have for now. Okay. I wanted to 
to uh, deal with some of the nuts and bolts uh, information that Becky said that we we're going to be dealing with uh, because it helps to understand this so that you can help walk the client through the process. It can also help as an attorney or an advocate if you're talking to the bank or you're talking to the surrogate's court to know uh, what things are called. I just want to go through some basics. If someone dies with a the will, it, the process of getting the will appointed is called probate. Probate is often used when there's no will, but technically probate is only when there is a, a valid will and it's commenced in surrogate's court where the party is domiciled, which is not always where the property is. But the goal of probate is to have the court accept the will as a valid last will and testament, give you a decree of probate, and appoint someone as a fiduciary, and in the case of probate, that would be the executor. If someone dies without a will, it's not called probate, it's called administration. And by the way, these forms are available if you go to the, uh, do a Google search for New York court forms, you can see the petition for administration, petition for probate. So administration is really the same, but instead of uh, distributing according to the will, whoever the legatees are, you, you're distributing according to law. So you don't get a probate decree, you get an administration decree. And you don't get letters testamentary, you get letters of administration. The third type of, this, of estate is uh, called a small estate proceeding, also called a voluntary administration. It's simple to fill out. It's about a three-page affidavit. And even if someone has a will, you can still file a voluntary administration. Often it's used for single assets or a uh, situation. Someone has a uh, bank account or some insurance policy they want to make claim to that's left to the estate. So you would file a voluntary administration petition. But the statute is clear. You cannot get authority to sign a deed or a mortgage. One of the things that is difficult for clients often to understand is why it's complicated to file proceedings in surrogate court. Because surrogate court, especially in probate proceedings, but in administration proceedings as well, they generally presume that the there's almost a statutory presumption that the will is invalid. So they want you to contact everybody who would have received if there was no will. They're known as distributees, and you need them to either consent or uh, if they're going to object, they have to come to court. So the attorney who is preparing the petition for probate needs to gather all the information uh, for who the surviving relatives are. And if, for example, there's a brother that's passed away who would be a distributee, and there's children, he has children, or the sister has children, you have to contact them and get their consent as well. So often while you're sitting with a client and they're saying that uh, they don't know where someone is or someone is not cooperative, that a red light should go off and that can cause a delay in administration or in probate. Again, the distributor's team must sign the waiver, to, uh, but if they won't, you present it to them. And often they're not motivated to do it, particularly if they see a will where they're not a legatee or not going to receive anything. But they're often not motivated to sign anything at all because they feel like they've gotten screwed somehow or they have a right that they want to assert that they should have inherited. Uh, so you're not totally stopped at that point though. You have to serve them with a citation. You contact the court, the surrogate's court after you file the petition and uh, tell them that you need a citation date. Then you have to serve the person and they have to come to court to state the reasons why they don't think either the will should be appointed, approved, or the fiduciary should be appointed. Other problems for an estate that they can delay approval uh, is someone is incompetent or is uh, under the age of uh, 18 without a, a surviving parent or is missing. Uh, you don't simply tell the court that someone is missing. They have to, uh, the court wants to make sure that the missing party or the incompetent party has their interest represented. For your client, this means more fees and delay. You'd have to file a, an application to have a guardian ad litem appointed, which is an attorney appointed for a limited purpose of making sure that the application uh, makes sense and is in the best interest of whoever they're representing. They come to court, they, get a, uh, uh, they give a report, and they also are awarded fees. So you need to make sure that the client 
if they understand there's someone missing or someone has to be represented, it's going to affect the legal fees that are required. Often, our clients, especially in foreclosure situations, they don't have any money. That's why they're in the foreclosure situation. Uh, but there are some fees that are simply going to have to be paid. Uh, often, attorneys get attorney's fees in the beginning. They don't get a retainer deposit on the estate because the parties receiving have to eventually consent to the fees or the court has to approve it. So most attorneys, at least in the Monroe County area, there might be different practices in other counties. You simply get the disbursements up front, and often the clients can't afford them. And so that can be a real delay, uh, unless I don't know anybody who advances filing fees in an estate uh, for anybody. The filing fees, there's a statute in the uh, Circuits Court Procedures Act that talks about the fees. It depends on the size of the estate. Even if the estate is practically insolvent, if the real estate is worth $600,000, you are dealing with a brownstone in Brooklyn, that's going to require a substantial uh, filing fee, probably $1,500. Uh, you can look up the schedule or if you email me or contact me, I can give it to you, uh, but that can be a roadblock block for our clients. The exception is the voluntary administration proceeding or the small estate proceeding. There, the filing fee is $1 and you do not need to get waivers and consents because the idea is with a voluntary administrator, you're not taking on broad responsibilities of a fiduciary, you're simply administering a single asset and you don't have to get waivers and consents. Any questions at this point? We have a couple. Um, let's see here. The first one is, will a bank require the surviving heir to produce a quick claim deed in order to proceed with a mortgage modification? I would assume they would need it at some point because the party to give the mortgage is going to represent that they own the property. So at some point they have to be placed in title. But that can be dealt with at or near the closing time. That's that's my belief, Dion. I don't know if you have a different view. Yes, um, they they will require unless it, it's passing by operation of the law, then you don't you don't necessarily have to do a quick claim deed to do to do anything. Although um, sometimes the title companies just want to see a deed there so the chain of title is not broken and it, it's just a clean chain of title. And that, that often comes up, up in uh, divorce situations where, uh, the, let's say, the wife is going to refinance and buy up the husband on the house. Uh, you won't get the quick claim from the husband until right before closing. So the, you just have to let the title folks know that it's coming, perhaps give them a copy of it, hold it in escrow. Uh, but a deed is definitely required, but the timing can be more fluid. Okay. Um, and then, Dion, this is for you specifically. Yeah. Can you supply the citations of those cases that were outside of bankruptcy court? Could you supply it to Michelle and I, and then we can distribute it to everyone that participated? Certainly. Certainly. Perfect. Um, and then one more question for now. Uh, I have had all I have had banks still refuse to talk to a client when they present a document from the surrogate's court stating that they are the voluntary administrator. She was told that she had to be the executor or they would not talk to her. Is that correct? Well, I mean, technically a, a voluntary administrator, and I'll, I'll talk about this in a little bit, uh, doesn't have the power to sign a deed or a mortgage. So the bank may ultimately be right, but there are times, and I'll talk about it a little bit later, when you try to craft the voluntary administration affidavit to give you some authority. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I have a situation right now where the surrogate's court in Wyoming County would not give me letters for a voluntary administration that contained the language I needed because they recognized what we were really dealing with was a mortgage. So the bank may be right, which would mean you'd have to go to a full-blown administration. Okay. All right, that's all I have for now. Okay, well, I, I put this in the materials because uh, often our clients don't understand what it really means to be appointed. Uh, it's a difficult job. It's a thankless job. Uh, if there's assets, you may receive a commission, generally 5% of the first 200000 and 4% after that with a different scale. So if there's cash, an executor can make out well. But often in our situations, the clients have no cash. That's why they're in foreclosure. So the question is, why would they step in? 
and be a fiduciary for an estate where they're probably advancing the filing fees. They have to figure out how the attorney is going to be paid. Uh, and they also have to account to everybody and distribute. It's, it's a thankless job. It's not a simple job. It does not end with the appointment. It just starts with the appointment. And probably a year or a year and a half later is when it's going to be closed. So it's important to under, for the client to understand that if they really are going to seek out an attorney to file a petition for administration or for probate, then it's a big job. The general responsibilities are to gather together the assets, pay all just bills, and distribute according to a will or according to law. Uh, so that's generally their job, and that's what the surrogate court at the end of the proceeding will be looking for the fiduciary to proven in accounting, that they have gathered together and protected the assets, which includes often making sure there's insurance on the property. If the homeowner's insurance is lapsed and the fiduciary has not taken care of that, that can be a breach of duty. The advantage of a voluntary administration or a small estate proceeding is that you don't take on such broad responsibilities and the accounting report is simply a one-page report. So again, if someone comes to you, all the assets were joint or there was a, uh, a joint tenancy so the property passed auto automatically by operation of law, but there's simply a bank account that's less than $30,000, you can file a petition to get per permission to access that account or have authority to, to address that account, and all you have to do is offer for an accounting for that particular asset. And if they later on find out there's another bank account or there's a a car or something else, you can file an amended affidavit and get a new letter. So the preference is to try to do a voluntary administration. I've worked with Becky on, on these before, but it doesn't always work as the question that was just asked. Sometimes the bank won't recognize it. People don't understand why it, states take so long. Uh, once someone is appointed, they generally get a letter from the surrogate's court telling them not to distribute anything until seven months, because if they distribute within seven months, they can be personally liable to the creditor. So a creditor may not serve a notice of claim against the estate till six and a half months later. If the fiduciary has already distributed the money, because the legatees are crying for it because they need the money, and it ends up it's really an insolvent estate or there's a shortfall for the creditor the fiduciary can be personally liable for the debt. I've done a lot of estates and even trying to move them along, it really takes about a year and a half. Clients don't understand that. Probate is often an area of criticism for attorneys as if attorneys are dragging their feet on it, but there are reasons why. As you can imagine, it takes time to identify the distributees to get forms to them, to get them to sign them, get them in the proper form, get the filing fee. Then once they're appointed, you really shouldn't distribute anything until seven months. Then you have to offer an accounting, either informal or formal, which can be complicated. Then you have to close the estate and file a, a closing attorney's affidavit or a petition for accounting that would close it out. So it really takes about 18 months, and I think you have to control your client's expectations that this is going to take some time. So basic, was there any questions at this point? Thank you. Becky? I was on mute. I ah, no problem. Um, so the question is, um, one of the questions is, is that seven months that you mentioned, is that statutory? Yes, it is. Well, actually, it, it might be in the, I, I, I know that we get a notice from the court. Uh, I, I imagine it's in the uh, Service Court Procedures Act, but I don't know. Okay. Uh, the other question is, I have a new case where a client wants to assume the mortgage from her deceased father. Apparently, the estate was probated, but the property was not part of that transaction. Have you ever heard of this, and can she work on an assumption? The only way it would not have been part of the probate estate is if it was in joint tenancy. Otherwise, it would necessarily have to be part of the probate unless someone submitted a wrong 
petition and excluded the asset. So you'd have to go back and amend the petition and get it included or find out who the joint tenant was. I can't imagine any other situation that, that would come up. Dion, any yes. No, I agree. I, unless her name was already on the deed and that's why it didn't necessarily have to go through pro it didn't have to go through probate, then it would have it should have been in the probate proceeding. So then what can she can she work on if there was some sort of a mistake where they might have to go and amend, um, and of course if she's already on the deed then there shouldn't be any issue in that regard with the yeah. deed. Step one be, would be to go to surrogate's court and look at the petition uh, or the, there's an accounting that has to inventory that has to be filed within six months of appointment. It would list all the assets even if they're non-probate assets. And there would also have to be some sort of an accounting so you could at least see why it was excluded, whether it was a mistake or whether it was joint property. Yeah. I, I mean, something as simple as just looking at the deed. I don't, I don't know what the deed actually says but maybe looking at the deed would give some clarification, and then, as Terry said, then you go to surrogate score. Okay. So um, Carol Richmond is the person that asked that question, so it may be helpful for her to call one of you for maybe some follow-up. It sounds like she has a very specific okay. fact pattern looking at. C certainly, certainly. Uh, at the end of the presentation, you'll see our, our contact information again. Okay, great. So that's it for now. Okay. Okay. It's, it's my experience that legal services attorneys are generally not experienced with people that have money. Most of your people don't have money and often don't have estates. So I, my advice is to stick with what you know, and if you don't, reach out to pro bono counsel to get help, which is what Becky has done with me before. And there's often attorneys that are uh, very experienced in estates and do not have an opportunity for pro bono. I was talking to someone about this before, that the estate attorneys don't, they often are looking for pro bono opportunities, but they simply can't find them. So I think if you reach out to your, your uh, volunteer legal services program in your area, I think you could find someone who would work with you to get the pro bono hours. There's also some new pro bono requirements on their, the attorney registration and reporting that may help you as well. Uh, item two I think is important because the clients come in and they're desperate and they want you to solve their problems, and you can do certain things for them, but you can't do everything for them. And I, I don't mean to be uh, condescending about that. I, I learned that as a young lawyer. I would often overpromise or uh, try to take on more problems than you can really address. So you have to let them know uh, what is involved with the estate proceeding before you can even get to the foreclosure proceeding sometimes. Although, as Dion says, maybe you can stay and should stay the foreclosure proceeding while you straighten out the estate proceeding. I, I've had uh, two situations where I, I tried to use voluntary administration uh, to solve a foreclosure problem. The, the one situation was where the property had already been foreclosed and transferred title was transferred to the bank and I'm dealing with a surviving spouse. We were able in Monroe County, and it was actually at the suggestion of the uh, uh, surrogate court clerk, to make an application for voluntary administration. And it said we wanted authority to negotiate with the bank to resolve the mortgage issue. They issued letters, and that was enough for us to uh, settle with the bank with a settlement agreement. The advantage of that, again, was that my, my client, who was a surviving spouse, did not have to deal with all of the decedent's children who were hostile to her, who would have had a stake in any sort of a probate or administration proceeding. And so we uh, were able to get the volunteer administration, we were able to get the letters to negotiate and resolve the issue. I felt like, well, I'm a genius, I'll use this every time. And just a couple of months ago, I tried it in a different county, and it did not work. The uh, service court clerk, uh, initially told me that they would grant it, and then they realized it had to do with the mortgage, and they refused to include broad language in the letters of administration. And so we are going to have to do a full-blown administration proceeding. So you can try to use voluntary administration. The filing fee is a dollar. You don't have to notify family members other than simply a letter that will be issued by the court. You don't have to do a full-blown accounting, but often 
it doesn't work if you really need the power to sign a deed or to sign a mortgage. Uh, the voluntary administration affidavit and letters of appointment are generally insufficient. Each county has a... Go ahead. I was just going to say, when it works, it's quite useful. <laughs> oh, yes. It, it, and and uh, it depends on the level of cooperation with surrogates court. The, the surrogates court, court clerk was trying to help us through a, a problem and came up with a solution. But, yeah, when it works, it's fantastic. Every county has a public administrator uh, who generally represents totally insolvent estates when there's no one else. Often it's to try to collect on a, a social services lien of some sort or something that could uh, create money for the county. But the public administrator uh, can be very helpful because they often can get appointed within a few days or a few weeks. The affidavit you get the public administrator appointed on behalf of the estate is only about two pages long. It's provisional what gets them appointed. And so if you're in a situation where you really have a, a quasi-insolvent estate and you don't have time to locate the relatives and get everything done to get appointed for an administration or for probate, you might consider contacting the public administrator. I've done that in Monroe County. Generally, they are willing to do it, but they want to know how they're going to get paid. And if it's an insolvent estate, you have to come up with some sort of a plan. In my situation, we had no cash, so the public administrator is looking to have the property sold so their fee can be paid, um, unless my client can come up with some cash, which they're trying to do. The fee is reasonable, but to my client, it's a lot of money. So it's worth contacting the public administrator to see if they can help, especially if you're in an emergency situation. I'm open for questions. <laughs> so we don't have any questions, but we do have minutes. Um, so maybe each one of you can identify I don't know, I'm searching to make sure we get our full credit here um, and we're waiting for any additional questions. So maybe you can talk about a particular experience.